ahead and um, let everybody proceed with this, but I do want to just uh, quickly give an update since I'll have to jump off in a minute about uh, Ge the Geologic Society of America had their conference a couple of weeks ago in Seattle and I attended um, a very well attended event. It was a water modeling event and I was an invited speaker to that event. Um, I was surprised there were probably 30 people in the session and at the end of the session um, there was a group of about five to ten people waiting around to continue the discussions about how do we take intelligent systems and merge them into the regular uh, uses, use case and uh, patterns that uh, groundwater modelers in particular are using on a regular basis. And then as another highlight, um, just recently and kind of around that Geologic Society of America timeline, um, the geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin um, are actually starting to really recognize the need to um, look more closely at intelligent systems. And there's recently been an award to a team at the University of Texas to work on an integrated water resources uh, project that um, they kicked it off and they started by talking about how do we engage with intelligent systems researchers. So the geosciences community is, um, I think, waking up to the, the real value in um, using intelligent systems and collaborating with computer scientists. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, apologies that I'll have to step off um, a few minutes in, but I'll, I'll stay here as long as I can. So with that, Amy, I'll pass it to you. Great. So this is the moment where I just ask everybody whether anyone has any new publications that are related to ISG that we should be listing. Anyone? All right, um, and maybe at this moment is a good place to fill in that we are starting a new one, basically the working group on education. It's, we start to put together a paper, and we really just started, we just like just put in share LaTeX and we just started a week ago where we basically start with a online survey we did at some point in a Google Doc of people who are in this network of what kind of courses they teach at the intersection of integration systems and geosciences. And we're kind of trying to make this a best practices paper where we just try to pass on the experience that people in our community have had and best practices and material that can be shared, uh, concerns that people have, how they resolve them. And so anybody who wants to be the co-author or wants to have their course featured or knows of any interesting course that we should be including, just drop me an email. So um, I think that's it for publications. We can move on to the next item. Which is upcoming oh. events, right? Upcoming events. Okay, so I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, the Knowledge Capture Conference is going to be on the beginning of December in Austin. And uh, we are organizing a workshop called CNO, which is about capturing scientific knowledge. And uh, well, we I, I advertised it here in the last call. We got some papers. Now I think uh, that the, the workshop is finally going to be a full day workshop, which is great. And uh, Suzanne is going to be our keynote speaker. So it's going to be very, very exciting. And I'll be happy to report back when, when this has happened. Uh, it's probably going to be the beginning of December. I don't know if I'll uh, have to miss the next call because it's actually on, <laughs> on the, on, on the first, well, maybe I, maybe we will be able to make it, but it's um, the, the conference is the fourth, uh, five and six of December, and the next call is going to be on the fifth, so it's going to be a little difficult for me at least to, to attend the, the call. But I'll be happy to report back. Uh, uh, the the conference chairs uh, encouraged us to um, like write a report afterwards uh, with the uh, main notes of the workshop. So I'll be happy to share those with you because I think that the, there is going to be quite a lot ISGO in, in the workshop as well. Um, and the Anna also sent a paper um, about provenance, capturing provenance uh, in, in, in her work. So I think it's going to be very, very exciting. And if you're around Austin and you want to come by on the 4th, of uh, December, uh, pay us a visit because, well, join the discussion. <laughs> it's going to be fun.
I, I just want to interject uh, quickly. Deanna Pennington is here where I am too. We're both in Annapolis right now. She's presenting on interdisciplinary collaboration to the postdoc group for the Succinct Center. So uh, nice. I think Gio's here. <laughs> so, well, next month we can continue the discussion on, on Sino. <laughs> Okay, so the next event is the ISGO session at AGU, uh, uh, Suzanne. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so AGU is coming up. Uh, every year we have our session. I'm actually not listed, I don't believe, as one of the chairs. So this year it's Mariana and Deanna Penn. Pennington and Sai Ravella, I believe, are the listed co-conveners. Um, I know that we have we have had the last two years very robust sessions. We expect to have robust sessions again this year, and I'm hoping that there are posters. In fact, I know there are posters as well. So I invite everyone that will be at AGU to please come. Please visit our session. They're dynamic sessions. I believe that we've got a lightning uh, session, so there are short presentations, and then we all reconvene down at the poster area where we can continue the conversations. Um, it's our tradition in San Francisco usually to go and get milkshakes after the session is done, and we will continue that somewhere. So if anyone knows New Orleans and has a suggestion for an excellent milkshake venue close to the conference, we need to know where that is. I'll start looking to figure that out. But please come join us. Uh, it's a chance for our community to really gather and talk and take advantage of just being informally together in a space. Um, if you know other folks, that may be interested in attending AGU, let them know that our session is happening and that it's wide open. We welcome anyone who's interested in joining the community and we'd, we'd love to have a really strong attendance and, and keep building this for future years. Awesome. Um, so, so I think that the, the, the next event is also going to be an ISGO session at uh, AAAS. Yeah, sorry, I need to talk about that as well. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're very fortunate to have been accepted. AAAS, the American Advancement for the Association of Science, has accepted our session, which is entitled, uh, I believe it's Artificial Intelligent for Intelligence Applications for Sustainable Water or uh, water sustainability. And um, it's a very competitive process to have that, to have a session accepted. Um, we're really fortunate to have it, have been accepted. Yolanda is the lead chair on that. Uh, Mary Hill is a convener. I am a convener. And then we'll have um, Vipin Kumar, uh, Scott Peckham, and uh, uh, Pat Gober, who's actually from Arizona State University, many of you won't know her, but she is the reason that the um, Decision Support Theater uh, at Arizona State has was built originally. It was part of the uh, Decision Sciences for a de Desert City um, program, and so Pat is a social scientist, but she's working consistently with computer modelers who are trying to build simulations for water um, management and planning. Um, so it should be, again, a very exciting session. Uh, AAAS is a massive conference. It will be in Austin in February. I believe that the dates are uh, February 8th through the 10th, something like that. Um, and so one thing that this group can consider is if we wanted to, we could tag along and add a couple of events for our own community, you know, the day after AAAS or something. So that's one possibility just to think about. And so if anyone has any thoughts or ideas or something you'd like to do um, as a small mini event, uh, let us know, let me know, let Yolanda or Ime know and, um, or Daniel, and we can uh, try and see what we can coordinate. So that's just an opportunity to come and again, convene and, and converge together in a space where we can talk with other scientists and researchers. That's it. Oh no, and then education, I see my name. <laughs> well, how about I get started? Okay, go. <laughs> and you back me up. So, um, the, this is just reports from what the working groups have been doing. And I, I know of two working groups that are relatively active right now. One is the education group, which kind of was dormant for a while, and we're just trying to restart again. And again, now, as I mentioned before, our first thing is just to write a paper about 
all the different ways to teach ISGO and giving examples and providing material and all that. For that group, we would love to have more members. Uh, it can also be students, there's all postdocs, anyone. Uh, one problem we have right now, we would like to do things like sending out a survey for people to fill, this, fill out what kind of material they have, having somebody look through that material. And since everybody on the list right now are faculty members that are very busy, we don't have that many volunteers. <laughs> so if there's anybody, junior, senior, who has a little bit more time, we would love to have you join. And anybody who joins us gets to have their name on the paper. And the way we usually do it is just anybody who contributes writing the paper gets their name on the paper. And we kind of keep track of who does how much, and that determines the order of the paper at the end. So mm -hmm. anybody is feel free, feel free to jump in and just send me an email or tell them. Do you, do you so, want to add to that, Susan? Well, uh, why don't you give the cases update and then I'll ask I have a question and then a comment. Okay, uh, cases. So that's the one where we have different, try to develop different case studies or benchmarks, basically data that already has a lot of, um, geoscience information with it and, and where geoscientists basically say these are the kind of analysis tasks we would like to see done so that it's easier for machine learning or other statisticians or whatever to jump in and work with that data um, and build new collaborations. It's all about building new collaborations. And there we finally finished the first benchmark. And so that's just sitting at JPL right now waiting for their approval before it can show up on the web page. And that's actually a very exciting one because it's about detecting methane sources from uh, flight data where you have, you fly over an area, you take infrared uh, spectrometer images and you try to figure out where there's methane. And especially in California, they now actually have to do a lot of those additional flights and that's given by the government. So there's a lot more funding in California to do that. And of course, in the long run, if we can have higher resolution satellite imagery, then if we want to really do the methane detection, we need to have an automatic algorithm. And right now, a lot of that is done by hand, but people really look at the images and raise a circle and say, oh, this looks like a methane source. This is the plume and this is how it's being dispersed. And that's what we want to automate and that's what this data set is for. It's a sample data set of methane data from, from airplanes, spectrometer data. And so again, so this one is done and we're just starting one about this from the sea ice um, hackathon topic last year and turning that into a benchmark and oh, we're hoping great. hoping to also do a visualization one with May Hill and Ibrahim Demir. The sea ice is with Andy Reins and Aaron, Aaron Trotschen. And so again, any of those benchmarks, anybody who wants to jump in, we'd love to have more people join. It's a and then book. I wanted to ask if Yolanda, uh, if you can talk right now, just one thing that we talked about was creating a new working group or resuscitating the um, simulation and modeling uh, group. Now that you and Bippin and Scott Peckham, I think, are working on a project that's uh, aligned with that. Is that a possibility? Yes, it, it is my plan. I think um, we talked in September about doing this, but I would get it started in December. So that's still my plan. Uh, I think we will focus on uh, characterizing and representing models in a way that differentiates them from other similar models with similar functions. Uh, we've been looking very closely at mod flow. Um, in the last couple of months, we've been looking very closely at different versions of mod flow for groundwater simulation, um, different assumptions. We've been looking at data preparation sub workflows. So just continuing what we started in the summer school. And um, so, so expect more around December um, uh, and, and the year, you know, next year. That's wonderful. That's super exciting. I, and I would just then, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. And then the, the last thing I wanted to be sure before I'll, I'll have to head out, and Victor, I will, I will definitely see everything you present um, in the recording. But I want to ask uh, Daniel, because we have so many early career researchers on the line, could you talk a little bit about the early career committee and how they might be able to engage with that group and, and potentially even help you to, to push forward on the leadership for that? Well, um... I, I don't know if I have a, a lot to, to say in that regard because 
uh, I mean, we, I know that we are we are a few people in the early career committee. We have been basically helping in any way we can with things in the website and so on and so forth. And that anyone that is interested in participating in ISGO can contact us for more information. And in general, we welcome everyone that wants to collaborate, of course. Um, but well, I I have very very uh, few little. Uh, else to say about the about the early career committee? Oh no, you have to pitch it. So, really and truly, I invite all of you to join Danielle and help <laughs> to push forward the early career committee. Um, uh, Mariana and um, Ayush, or no, Ankush are um, are. Oh no, it's Anuj. Excuse me. Are the conveners for the AGU chair? Um, they're the chairs for the session at AGU. Daniel mm -hmm. is leading his session. So what we're really finding is that the early career committee is stepping into the leadership for the community, and that's as it should be. So there are so many opportunities. As Ime said earlier, please uh, pick the working group that you would like to join or. Uh, determine if you'd like to propose a new working group and we would welcome and support um, ideas that you bring to the community so I'm glad that you guys have all joined us today so <laughs> can I can I say uh, a couple more words uh, because I agree with Suzanne that this group can provide a lot of opportunities so when when I was younger myself I love to put myself in charge of communications among project members because that way it was guaranteed that I would hear about everything and I would be aware of everything so right now if especially if you're new to ISGEO um, if you if you sign up or help with um, you know keeping all the information in the website up to date um, doing things like what Danielle has been doing for a few months now which is organize these calls uh, you're kind of immediately embedded in all the activities and so uh, it's a very useful way to learn more about things to work with people to learn um, about everything that's going on and to to get more involved so so if you have an interest um, in uh, helping us improve the website maybe there's information that you didn't find that you wish you had found first joined or um, organizing the weekly call, start to do them yourselves. Maybe in a couple of months, he can teach you how to do it. So we, we welcome all kinds of participation. Yeah, um, um, thank you. Thank you, Landa and Susan for complimenting uh, um, what, what, what little I said. So um, finally, before going to the Victor's presentation, I would I would like to um, well uh, encourage anyone that wants to present in future telecoms to contact me <coughs> because um, because we are looking for speakers also in the upcoming telecoms and this is a great uh, opportunity to let everyone know about what you are doing and also for fostering collaborations with other researchers in ISGO and uh, generally. People are very, very uh, keen to asking questions and give feedback on what you are doing. So uh, normally we have we have had uh, senior um, uh, researchers uh, presenting what uh, their advances or what they have been doing in the past. But I think that it would be a very, very nice idea also to welcome new uh, participants uh, participants on introducing what they are doing on the on the research because it, it also helps for visibility and collaboration in general. Okay, uh, so well, if anyone has an idea for, for a talk and just wants to do it, just let me know and uh, we can organize something in a future ISGO Telecom. Um, and finally, without uh, further ado, I mean, I want to introduce uh, uh, Victor Pankratius. Which uh, who leads the astro and geoinformatic groups at the MIT uh, High Stack Observatory, and um, where, where basically he advances data science as a principal investigator in projects supported by NASA and the NSF. Um, so uh, today, Victor will be uh, introducing his latest work on computer-aided discovery. 
and uh, he's working towards the goal of making a machine win the Nobel Prize. So I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. Welcome, Victor. I think you're muted. We cannot hear you very well. We cannot hear you, Victor, sorry. Or at least I cannot hear you. Maybe, um, can anyone hear what Victor is saying? No? I cannot. Me no. neither. Let me try this. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Victor. Hi. So uh, I just want to provide a tiny contribution to making a machine win a Nobel Prize. I think that's a bigger task that requires uh, community collaboration and support. So it, it, this is something that I think is similar to the moon landing. You know, we need a goal as a community in order to know like where do we want to be and how do we evaluate the work that we're doing. Um, and I think, um, you know, have, having like a long-term goal that is ambitious is a good way for us to uh, evaluate how we can work together and, and make, you know, steep progress towards uh, achieving certain capabilities. So um, today I want to show you some of the um, results we have achieved so far uh, for computer-aided discovery. And I just shared my screen with all of you. I hope you can see it. Is it visible? Okay, um, so uh, one, one of my um, goals is to look at uh, geosciences, but not just geosciences, also astronomy and, and other data. And uh, one quick question that I think is coming up uh, again and again is how do we generate insight from data? And if um, you're looking at, you know, the bigger picture is um, we need scalable machine assistance for humans in the discovery process, just because we're gonna be flooded with data everywhere. We have sensor networks all over the planets, uh, this planet and soon <laughs> other planets, but uh, also we have satellites, uh, we have telescopes. So all of this comes together and we're heading uh, into an era where we have petabytes per second data rates. So uh, clearly this is going to be uh, limited uh, with our cognitive capacity. So as humans, we need to have the right tools to amplify our abilities. And this is something that um, we're trying to you know, push forward. How do we enhance this discovery process? How do we scale it? And uh, I'm resisting to say artificial intelligence or machine learning here just because I think, uh, you know, this is something that's more general and artificial intelligence and ML as it's used today, it's, you know, it's, it's currently very trendy to put machine learning on everything you have. So if you have an AGU abstract, you know, make sure you have AI and ML some, somewhere in the title. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, if, if you're taking a step back at, uh, what is done today, you will mostly see tasks like um, classification, you know, trying to find uh, what certain things mean semantically. So I was trying to visualize that on, on this slide here. So if you're looking at this from a semiotics perspective, like uh, semiotics is uh, more from uh, communication theory and information theory. And uh, there you have like three different layers. One layer is syntax, which means you have the data and the data has the right encoding. It has the right ordering that you expect. Um, and for instruments, that just means, well, we have the right numbers that encode the measurements that we actually want to make. Uh, the next level is semantics. And this is where everyone is focusing on today. We have data exploration, data analysis, data mining. This is where the majority of the AI techniques, I think, as they are applied today, fit in, mostly machine learning. So realize AI is much bigger than just machine learning. But machine learning aims to sift through all your data and classify phenomena, telling you, you know, these sets of pixels or these pieces of your time series, uh, you know, or this part of your data corresponds to feature X, Y, or Z. So then you end up with these classes. Um, and this is really helpful for what we have today, but just imagine the world where you have the perfect classification algorithms. 
So you still end up with billions and billions of features, right? So you just shift the problem to another level where now you have to figure out how, of, how all of this fits together, okay? So just because you find a new feature or you find a new phenomenon, it doesn't give you a lot of knowledge. The knowledge comes from you knowing that you've found something new, that you found something that fits into a certain theory or that it doesn't fit into a certain theory, and if it doesn't fit, you would like to have a computer tell you why it doesn't. You know, maybe even go back to the equations and tell you, well, I found something, it violates these equations, and if you were to correct these equations in a certain way, then you would be able to explain um, the world, including the current phenomenon. And this is the level of pragmatics where I'm trying to um, create more depth into what we're currently doing um, and if you want to get to this level you need to have domain knowledge because otherwise how do you know that you have found something new or how do you know that, that a certain uh, part of your data set is say a new planet or a volcanic event or things like that it means you have to know something about volcanic events how they manifest how they differ from noise uh, and, and what their characteristics are uh, and this is, I think, uh, one of the frontiers that we have to tackle in AI as well these days to infuse more domain knowledge into the algorithms that we are using. So we're gradually shifting away from domain agnostic approaches to more uh, domain aware approaches where the algorithm can only uh, also tell you not that it has found something new, but also why and how it is new and in which way it is new. And I want to uh, outline an approach that we've applied pretty successfully so far. Um, and this slide shows you the computer-aided discovery approach we have from a meta level, all right? So how do we infuse model knowledge into this discovery search? And if you're looking at uh, the slide, you see two basic um, divisions. You have empirical data on the one end, uh, but then the theory on the other. And the empirical data is what you collect from a variety of instruments. You know, this can be satellites, this can be uh, sensor networks. Um, sorry, just sensor networks and data products created from uh, one or more instruments. So you can also leverage data fusion to combine information that you have from one instrument that you don't have from the other. Um, and this all happens uh, in the cloud these days. You have some supercomputer somewhere storing this data and processing this data. But then on the other end, you have the theory. And here I'm visualizing a theory from uh, ionospheric processes uh, where we have a simple model with two slides. So it's two parameters, and imagine you can move these sliders you know, from one end to the other, and depending on how you set these sliders, uh, the shape that you see at the bottom of the slide uh, appears uh, to be shaped differently, right? So this is what the model would predict that you would see if, you, if this theory was true. This is what the model would predict this phenomenon would look like. So here you end up with a search space because there's a search space defined by the model parameters but also by the algorithmic choice and the model choices that you make in this space so then you have the theory space which produces different variants of models you might expect to see in reality the empirical data has another space which is defined by the processing pipelines. Because it turns out, and I just want to move to the next slide for a bit, it turns out if you're taking the same raw data set and you're applying different workflows to the data set, uh, you might highlight different kinds of phenomena. Um, so for example, here you would see the data set for the Earth's ionosphere based on uh, GPS measurements. And that's a whole nother talk on how to obtain that, but for now just uh, you know, look at these pretty pictures, and the phenomena are highlighted uh, as total electron content. So you see different colors for different levels of electron content, total electron content. And you already see that if you choose a certain pipeline um, with certain filters or certain variables that you configure in these filters, 
you might highlight large-scale phenomena, or you can highlight small-scale phenomena, or you can highlight nothing because some things might just cancel out in your analysis and you don't realize that. And this is a problem these days because pipelines are getting more and more complex and they're developed by different people. So it's very easy to configure a pipeline that intuitively everybody thinks is the right thing to do, but then you're creating an image or a data product that totally obscures your discoveries, the potential to make discoveries. And therefore, on the empirical side, you also end up with a search space. And the search space is defined by which algorithms you're choosing, how are you chaining them together, um, how you configure each stage in a processing workflow with parameters and so on. So then you have the second search space. And this is uh, the search space on the empirical data. So now you can see how this becomes the search problem, essentially, because now what you want to do is you want to match potential theory variants of theories that might describe reality and phenomena you might expect to see with the data sets to see if those phenomena actually occur. But then you have to try out different pipelines to process uh, the raw data in such a way that you have a chance to find what you're looking for. And this is what we are essentially building. We're building this kind of scalable cloud search and um, in this pipeline and in, in the uh, decision, how do we search the search space, that's where we use a variety of techniques, including uh, artificial intelligence in a broader sense and machine learning in a, in a more specific sense. Um, so this is the, the, the overall picture. And now I want to show you that, um, how does this uh, transform into concrete geoscience problems? Because one thing you can imagine is this, these search spaces are very big. So you need to be able to prune them over time. And imagine this is like a big chess game. Right, so you make a move by choosing an algorithm for your empirical data processing, uh, and then you're spanning like a tree. So if you make that move, choosing algorithm one, say uh, a median filter or a Kalman filter to do something, then you're making another move after that, a move which is, oh, I'm choosing a certain model of my ionosphere, uh, and then with certain parameters and so on. So you're spanning like trees. And now what you can do is you can learn over time as you reanalyze your data with different parameters, you can learn over time which parts of these three uh, are not promising to look for just because you didn't highlight anything interesting or, or you turn out not to find anything. So you can reduce the probability to search in those branches. Uh, and then uh, you can essentially use machine learning to prune that search space heuristically. Uh, in addition, you can also ask the user to provide information whether uh, certain phenomena that were uh, found, uh, whether they are the ones that were actually of interest or not. So there's a variety of techniques that you can use to prune the search space. Um, and I want to show you um, like uh, at a very high level the kind of modeling you can think of here for those of you who are computer scientists. Um, you know, how do you model this algorithmic choice? And there's a notation that um, uh, the software product line community has developed, uh, which is essentially de describing uh, choices. So suppose here you have a theory representation space uh, and you have a model, uh, and then you can say, well, I have my basic model, which contains submodel one and submodel two, but if I choose submodel two, I have to choose either alternative one or alternative two. And in case you're choosing alternative one, then you have certain parameter ranges for your variables uh, and certain pre-processing algorithms and so on. Uh, so this is another way uh, that is probably more compact than just enumerating a, a large Boolean table of choices for each potential variant. But you might choose to do that in that way as well. And then what you want to do is you want to take these model variants and run them on your specific data sets with the different workflows and see which ones you know, produce a good match uh, with respect to certain objective functions. You know, how good is your prediction versus what you have found? And then you end up with these uh, comparisons 
which help you better assess which model or which theory describes reality in a, in a better way. Uh, on the other hand, um, this is how you can find new phenomena because as you're searching for things in your data, the ones that don't match uh, will pop up and tell you, I'm not matching well with this data. I found something, it's similar, but it's not exactly what you were looking for. And it's not exactly because, and then you can trace an explanation into the model, uh, into the equation, into the algorithm telling you why. So you're getting a little bit of higher level knowledge uh, where uh, there's this mismatch between theory and, and empirical data. Um, and this is the last, you know, more architecture slide. And then I want to show you concrete case studies that we've done and how we found actually new phenomena in volcanology, for example. So uh, our cloud infrastructure uh, has several layers. We have one layer that integrates uh, data from different sensors and satellites. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, Scikit, the Scikit uh, the data access Python package later on. We wrote a, a Python package that makes it very easy to pull data from different instruments, but have the same API for everybody. The same API that in Python looks to you like Pandas data frames, so you don't have to care about those formats. So then you can integrate these data together, and then you have a service layer which essentially implements these searches with model-based knowledge. And uh, the heat map that you're seeing here is uh, one way that we're using to visualize the comparison between uh, variants, theoretical variants, and workflows that we have tried out, and how similar the results are for each configuration. So then you can see, oh, there's a bunch of models that are all very similar in this dark area, and there's a bunch of models that are in this white area which are similar, and there's another set that uh, is like something in between. So you can cluster these results and say, I want to see one representative model that is on this extreme end. I want to see one representative model on this other extreme end and see if that really describes uh, what I'm looking for. Now, this is a bit abstract, so I want to show you something concrete. Um, so we've tried this uh, on several uh, case studies, one of which is volcanics. Um, and uh, in, in volcanics, people de deploy GPS sensors uh, to measure earth deformation. Uh, this is part of the uh, plate boundary observatory, so you can uh, track earth deformation in, in various contexts. Uh, you can uh, look for groundwater, which I'm going to talk about as well. Uh, deformation due to groundwater depletion, but uh, there's an application in volcanics and seismology. Um, and here what we did was to uh, get the time series for each GPS sensor located on uh, Aleutian Islands um, in Alaska. And this is the, um, these are two volcanoes that we were looking at, uh, Akutan and Shishaldin. And uh, they have several GPS receivers deployed. So if you were to look at one of those, these are the three time series you see here uh, at the top of the slide. This is what you would get if you were to look just at the raw time series, which gives you uh, movement in three spatial directions. So the next thing that you can do is you can take all of these GPS sensors on the volcano and transform them to see if you see an inflation, to see if the volcano does this. And uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot of noise or other phenomena that uh, might be superposed on your signal. So it's quite some work that you have to put in to remove all of that. And uh, this is a great case actually why you need domain specific knowledge. So you know, suppose you're taking your time series. Uh, the second step in our pipeline is a trend filter. So we remove all the known trends. We know there are uh, annual trends. We know there's various trends that we can remove with linear filters or with other filters. Those have to be taken away, uh, right? Because if you're looking at an inflation event, uh, then you want something like uh, a, a final metric where um, if there's nothing, you just see a flat line. But if there's an inflation event, you would see some kind of displacement. So then by gradually removing all known phenomena that could mimic inflation events, 
then with what you're left, you know, so we're also removing the noise, uh, with what you're left is essentially the inflation uh, uh, characterization. So you need to remove the current, the trends that you know of. Then there's one specific thing here. If you have snow on the antennas, it delays the GPS signals, which mimics inflation events, which is not, but you need to remove them. So we are uh, pulling data from the National Snow and Ice Data Center to know whether at a certain location, at a certain time, there was snow or not, and then apply a different processing technique to, um, to this filtering. Then the next step would be denoising. And here you have alternatives. Uh, we're listing two, Kalman filters and median filters, which are common in the uh, literature here, but once you choose a common filter, you have ranges of parameters. So you see how this already starts spanning your search space. Um, people traditionally configured this manually, uh, and then uh, they, of course, found certain events. But uh, you know, I want to tell you that it's because we described the search space that we were able to find non-intuitive configurations, which led to the discovery of new events. Okay. So you have denoising, but then you want to create like higher level data products. You want to do a principal component analysis. And what that does is if you're looking at the bottom left of this picture at a volcano, you see arrows. Uh, they, uh, the, the dots are the GPS uh, um, sensors, the GPS stations. And these arrows are the result of uh, principal component analysis that would tell you roughly like how would this volcano be pulled apart um, but as you can see, there's variation in those arrows, and those variations depend on different parameter choices uh, in your PCA algorithm. In this case, we're lucky it's pretty stable, but uh, you might be less lucky in other cases, which is why you want a computer to try out other possibilities as well. So once you have the PCA, the next thing you want to do is you want to fit a model. You want to know where's the magma chamber, how is it formed, how much magma is there, and so on. In this model, we have a red dot, which is where we assume based on the uh, inverse model of, these, uh, of this PCA analysis, where we assume uh, the, the center is. And in this case, it's a simple model. It's a spherical model called the monkey model. But you might as well try more complex models. And this pipeline you see, you have a Mobi source, a SIL source, you can do you know, many other variations that I don't want to discuss. The important thing is you have a lot of possibilities that span a search space. So it's non-trivial. Once you have this you know, general description, you can generate instances of pipelines that will all lead to certain uh, uh, predictions of what you think where the inflation events are. Um, and also, depending on the choice of the model, you will see variations in where you think the center of these uh, chambers is. Uh, so um, we've tried it out with our approach. And uh, after you know, applying what, what I described in a very general fashion, we uh, detected the events that uh, were already known in the literature. So this is an example that uh, shows you on the left uh, what our system detected versus on the right what was published in the literature. Uh, so, um, you know, initially we were thinking as computer scientists, it's good to take a data set that everyone has chewed on, you know, for over 10 years. And everyone has published on this data set. And basically, it was a good um, example to see if we can find what's out there. But then, to our surprise, uh, we found new events. And this is the kind of uh, result I'm talking about. So you see on the x-axis, you see time. And then on the y-axis, you see this, this uh, aggregate metric for amplitude, which tells you there's an inflation event, which is over, over a long-term period. Okay? Uh, if there was no inflation event, you would expect a, fa a flat line. And um, we wrote this up, we submitted this to the Journal of Volcanology and Geothermal Research. Um, three volcanologists reviewed it and they said, yes, we have found new events. And we were very um, um, you know, lucky in a sense, but also I think um, we, we were able to demonstrate that if you can um, offload some of this 
uh, search uh, for discoveries, especially the ones that are non-intuitive, uh, then we have a better chance of making new discoveries. And this was like the first shot at it and it um, worked. Um, so these are just a few more explanations that I don't want to uh, go into uh, detail given the time, but it's just a comparison of different configurations and how the models um, um, you know, were similar or dissimilar to each other. So this is something that a geoscientist could pick out and say, yeah, I see that there's a bunch of configurations that are similar. Give me one example of those, and then I'm going to look into it if this is uh, a model that you know, make, makes sense in reality, or maybe it's you know, a computer-generated version that is not really useful. OK, um, are there any questions so far? All right. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Oh, yes. Um, go, go ahead. Well, do you need to assume that any or, or all of these models are actually valid models? So is that, is that the exercise you're doing is basically um, choosing a model which gives you some event that you would like to publish. Is that, is that the exercise or not? Or you well, um, actually determine which of these models is better, you know? Yeah, so it's possible that, you know, through the combination of these different pipeline configurations, you get a model that does not describe reality well. Um, which is why uh, at some point, um, you have to do this clustering. So that's, that's how we excluded um, or, or have the scientist in the loop to help exclude classes of models that um, do not describe reality well. So you apply basically a clustering on all the results and then you look at one example from one of these clusters and if the scientist mm -hmm. deems that to be less uh, useful than another, then you can just prune that entire cluster. Right. So but then the you number gradually... of possibilities of this model combination, like the number of paths in your tree, could be you know may, many more than the number of scientists, right? So technically, you cannot look at into every possibility and to check whether it's true or not. Yeah, but on the other hand, right now it's done manually. So right now we have nothing. <laughs> right, right now, we yeah, I understand. Situation. But you can I, the way I envisioned you would go with this talk is that you would have some sort of true uh, data set saying that uh, you know there are some disinflation inflation events um, that are you know a God given truth, and then you would uh, well check I'm which afraid that actually. does not exist in in science yeah. like that, um, and I. I I believe that um, you know it's it's a problem that um, AI has today because it assumes we have all sorts of training sets, and in certain cases, like take natural hazards as an example, um, we have sparse training sets, and uh, um, I think it's a problem where supervised learning algorithms. If, if maybe that's related to your question. Uh, where supervised learning algorithms assume we have a big enough training set, we train the algorithm, and then we just find everything. And uh, most uh, training sets uh, I've come across in geoscience are sparse. There's sparse, you know, there's only a few volcano eruptions that you can look at, but it's not volcano eruptions all the time, which I think it's great. You know, I don't want natural hazards all the time. I like sparse training sets in geoscience. Um, and regarding the search, the search space, there are certain uh, th theoretical aspects that I'm uh, not discussing right now where you know, large search spaces, you might not have a chance to search for everything. Then you're you know, closely related to um, NP-complete problems. Uh, that you know are very difficult to solve. So, if, or in other words, if you were able to find a solution in this context to search the space more efficiently, maybe uh, then conversely you're going to find a solution to some of these theoretically hard problems. Uh, so, I think uh, you know for now um, we're looking at heuristics, um, and and so far the the new discoveries that we've made you know make make some progress in that direction. But uh, I'd be happy to learn more if, if somebody has a great solution, you know, to this efficient search space uh, traversal 
I think that that's great. You know, this is like an entire field. Um, you know, how do you do that efficiently? Right. And another comment is that um, you have constrained yourself to a certain class of models, which scientists already already know and already work with. So this algorithm does it allow you to develop a new type of model or not, like yes. outside of your existing set of possibilities? Yes, that's why I'm showing more examples, examples. now. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank so you. So the idea is, you know, what, what I've showed you is uh, it's, um, it's like a meta-level approach, but you can reconfigure it with domain-specific knowledge depending on the domain you're looking at. And uh, we explicitly want to leverage domain-specific knowledge because that's where... Uh, the power of this comes in. Like here in the volcano example, if you don't know that you have to remove uh, you know, the snow effects, you get totally wrong results. But on the other hand, you don't need the snow effects for, for other studies, all right? So uh, you have to be domain specific. I think that's something that computer scientists absolutely need to learn. Uh, they cannot stay as general as they are used to in the past. So, you know, computer science has to move away from just drawing arrows and boxes and, and somebody has to fill that in. Uh, I don't think that's going to work anymore. We have to learn more about the problem, uh, find, you know, domain-specific solutions, but then on the other hand, uh, also have as much generalization as possible because I don't want to develop like an old programming language just to solve one problem. Okay, so it's this balance that we have to find. But I think the, the burden lies on both communities. Computer scientists need to learn more about the actual problems they're solving. And geoscientists need to learn more about the principles of the algorithms that we have out there right now. Okay, because they have fundamental weaknesses and fundamental approaches to how they find solutions. Um, so this is, um, you know, I think that's that's part maybe of a, of a bigger discussion, but um, yeah, I agree. Search spaces are an important topic. Okay, so um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm uh, skip through the next slides a little bit faster. So basically using uh, this uh, framework, Work in this approach, we've looked at groundwater studies as well, uh, and we've discovered uh, anomalies when um, you have uh, wells that behave uh, differently in different regions. Um, I personally find it very interesting that you can uh, take the gray satellite, which looks at uh, changes in the Earth's gravity, and then see the groundwater depletion in grays. Uh, so that map is. Uh, you know, has a very, um, is very coarse granular. It doesn't have good resolution, which is why we're combining it with GPS. And then you have, again, many time series, uh, which you can correlate with different instruments to find anomalies. Um, so let me uh, move on to another topic that I wanted to show you here. Um, so I mentioned that uh, when you're building this discovery pipeline, um, then you also need a way to detect features in order you know, to fit to see later how it fits into a theory. And now I want to move to this aspect to show you. So, you know, let's leave this computer aided model based uh, approach for a moment and just see an approach where we want to find features um, in, in uh, um, data sets. And I want to show an example for atmospheric turbulence where we're using uh, deep learning and neural networks. And um, I think GPS is an interesting um, instrument because you can use it for navigation, you can use it to study the ionosphere if you're looking at uh, dispersive delays in the frequencies. If you're looking at non-dispersive delays, you can study the troposphere. And it turns out there are certain types of features and noise that would be introduced when there's atmospheric turbulence, uh, in particular ones that would be related to Lee waves. And uh, my, my co-PI, uh, Tom Herring here at MIT, had actually a bachelor's thesis uh, um, of a student who did an in-depth analysis that you could see uh, that there's a correlation when there are Lee waves near mountains and how GPS signals are distorted. Now, we, we're trying to take this to the next level and have a neural network learn to detect these kinds of Lee waves. 
Uh, but then we can learn from two instruments. One is MODIS, which is uh, here a, an example satellite image showing you uh, how Lee waves would show up. So if you have clouds, you would see these ripple patterns. Um, but then, of course, uh, what do you do when you don't have cloud patterns and you have Lee waves? So obviously, this classifier, in a way, only works in certain cases. With GPS, uh, on the other hand, you can look at the time series um, and find these features when there are Lee waves, you know, independent of the cloud patterns. Now, the disadvantage of GPS is that um, you have it only in certain locations. Um, so now what we have done um, is to combine these two. So you can build essentially two classifiers. Uh, and what we did is uh, build uh, uh, a convolutional neural network that does the classification based on the MODIS images first. Uh, and then uh, we have another pipeline doing the GPS scoring, and then we're fusing these together. So then uh, going back to this image, you know that you have a location for each GPS uh, sensor, which you can also relate to a position in this image that is taken from the satellite. So then what you can do is you can um, detect the cloud patterns. Like here, for example, on the lower uh, left, you see how the neural network would detect the pieces of an image where you see this ripple in there that would help uh, enhance the support that uh, that particular location it would have um, these Lee wave patterns. So this is an example where you can combine information from two types of instruments. One is like based on time series, the other one is based on images, but taking these together, uh, you can enhance the classification of such phenomena. And then this is something that you can take later on at the higher level with the computer discovery and have a model that tries to you know, fit uh, models of Lee waves and try to infer something about the physical processes there. So before I, uh, uh, I finish, I want to point you to some open source code that we have released, uh, if you want to play around with that. Uh, one is the scikit data access Python package. Uh, and this has come uh, out of the necessity that we want to be able to use a variety of data sets. Uh, like here, we have NASA data sets, we have USGS, we have UNAFCO, uh, and we want to use them easily with uh, three to five lines of Python. So all I want to say is, you know, import geo.pbo, then I want to say uh, the, the station, and then I want to get the time series. And we've gotten to the point that it's that simple because uh, what we're doing is we're providing one API to all these other data sets. So the data sets stay where they are on the respective servers, but what we do is we provide one common API. And you can request chunks of that data, um, and the chunks are pandas data frames once you are in Python. So you don't have to care about file formats, parsing, all these things. You just pull the data, and uh, just to show you a general example, so do, I'm not expecting you to read every line of code here, uh, but this is just to show you uh, how easy it is to pull different kinds of data. So if you are an astronomer, you, you can write through lines of code and get a light curve from the Kepler telescope to search for exoplanets, or if you want to get data from the plate boundary observatory, uh, you're using the geo.geo. PBO namespace, uh, you would specify uh, the, the time um, that you want, and the location that you want, and then you get the time series. And then you can do whatever you want, say applying scikit-learn or our tool sets that build on top of that. Uh, another uh, tool set that integrates with the scikit data access is scikit discovery. This is something that's in flux right now, but we started to release certain functionality that we already have. But there's functionality for exploratory data analysis. Like if you want to decompose signals and time series in certain ways, uh, you can uh, do that easily. So suppose you, know, you want to do it uh, wavelet decomposition or Fourier decomposition or a Hilbert-Wang transform. 
uh, you can apply that and see what happens to your result. Uh, you can also build some of these configurable uh, processing pipelines that we use in our Volcano example, where you define algorithmic choice for your stages, and then you have the uh, framework try out different versions of that pipeline and generate different data products that might help you make a discovery. And then we have a third uh, GitHub um, repository, which is the science case studies. Uh, so all of the science case studies are Jupyter notebooks, uh, and they're self-contained. So uh, for example, for this volcano study that I mentioned, there's one Jupyter notebook that shows you like end-to-end -end how to do it. Uh, it also has uh, educational parts in it, like references to the papers, um, it has the code, it has uh, intermediate results, like uh, intermediate pipelines that were generated with, with models and how the models would look like under certain configurations. So if you want, you can download that and then start changing parameters and see you know, what happened if I had applied something else, or maybe even add your own processing and maybe uh, make new discoveries in that way. Uh, so this is something that we're aiming for, not only um, as, a, as a way to reuse what we're producing for, for science purposes, but also for, for teaching purposes. So I'm using this very often for students to help them get into uh, various fields, and we aim to expand um, this, um, this repository even further. Uh, potentially, you know, if you consider uh, creating material, we are happy to add, you know, your Jupyter notebooks to this repository. You know, this can be uh, bigger. We, we started this as something that came out of our own group, but um, if you have something, uh, we're happy to, you know, expand this and open up to the entire community. And then we have a nice uh, self-contained repository of Jupyter notebooks. And uh, as a final note, uh, everything is cloud-based, which gives you the power to run all these analyses from your phone. All you need is a web browser. Um, so uh, I, I was told that geoscientists uh, seem to be um, very excited about this opportunity because now you can go out in the field, uh, you can set up your experiment, you can set up your deployment of instruments, and if you happen to uh, come across something that's unpredicted, you just pull up your phone and you rerun the entire analysis on big data in the cloud. So you, you don't have to worry that you, know, you don't have the uh, right environment with you. As long as you have an internet connection, uh, you can go back to the cloud and uh, you know, just pull everything you need. Uh, and I think that is uh, a, a game changer as such, like what cloud computing and, and AI can do now because it's not only um, helping us to make new discoveries, but it's also changing uh, the way we are collecting data and the way we optimize the data collection because we have all these capabilities. Um, it can also go so far to interface directly back into the instrument. So you can have computer discovery to discover events, but then depending on what you find, reconfigure the data collection to be more focused or broader uh, with respect to uh, what your science is. So uh, if you want to read more about this, we have an uh, overview article in IEEE Intelligence Systems, uh, which is referenced here. The volcano case study is uh, published in depth in the Journal of Volcanology and Geothermal Research. And then I have a bunch of more uh, results uh, referenced on my website. Uh, I want to show you what we're uh, going to present at AGU if you want to stop by. So these are different bits and pieces uh, of this work. Um, so the uh, deep learning for um, atmospheric turbulence is going to be presented uh, on Monday. Then we have uh, a talk. So all of these are talks. Uh, then we have a talk on the uh, tool that we've developed to discover anomalies uh, related to groundwater. Um, and related to the correlation between GRACE, GPS, and well data. Uh, that's going to be on Wednesday. Then we have a discovery on the um, earthquake signatures of the 2016 New Zealand earthquake, 
uh, that show up in the uh, ionosphere. And uh, this talk is going to be on Friday. I think this is uh, interesting because um, normally the average scientist doesn't know that there's a coupling between earthquakes and uh, phenomena in the ionosphere. But this is one of these examples where we can clearly show, also using uh, GPS as a remote sensing instrument, that uh, the earthquake waves propagate up and then you have the um, various disturbances in the ionosphere, various wave propagation patterns that we can pick up. Um, and then uh, a last talk is about uh, machine learning applications for uh, interferometry done from satellites in space. So this is the INSAR satellites. Uh, these satellites essentially um, take different passes and um, um, allow you to create interferograms so you can see Earth deformation patterns uh, very precisely. Um, what you see here is an application to urban environments. So here we're able to uh, apply the specific technique so you can distinguish streets from buildings and see that there's uh, subsidence on the street level versus uh, the buildings. So the buildings, in the buildings you would even see thermal expansion in, in the summer, for example. And this is determined by uh, the time series behavior and the, the image here shows you that um, if you can classify those time series together that behave similarly, most likely you will find interesting things when you're looking back at the, um, at the reference in the, in the real world. And in this particular case, this is how you see a street behaving differently from uh, a line of buildings. This is going to be on Wednesday with my collaborators from the Netherlands. And then last but not least, uh, we have developed uh, computer discovery techniques for landing site uh, selection on Mars. Uh, this is uh, probably a, a talk on its own, but uh, you know, feel free to ask me questions. Um, so I think uh, you know, given the time, if if you have uh, questions, feel free to send me emails, uh, and I also have more references on on my website. And I'm happy to take more questions now as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, uh, we are a little over time, but uh, but um, I would I would like to to let uh, everyone. Uh, well, someone ask uh, at least uh, one question. Does Does anyone has one question? I have three questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I can also ask them offline. So let me just go ahead and try to make it short. So this was really interesting. I'm, I'm kind of on the other end. I'm always working with the domain science and trying to figure out what pre-processing should be used. And I'm exactly where what you were describing before matches me perfectly because I'm more, I try to find cause-effect relationships, mm -hmm. but I can only find them if the causal signatures in the data were really strong. Mm -hmm. So what happen, happens often is a geoscientist gives me data and says, okay, do such and such pre-processing. I run my algorithm and we say, wow, we should be finding such and such, but we don't. What should we do differently about the pre-processing? So we go back and we go in loops like this several times around. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I didn't know that there is like a language for the pre-processing. And so my first question, and we can discuss it offline is, I would love to get a reference for, for this pre-processing language so that we can use this and be more efficient. Number two, what is the search space? I mean, it seems like there are different types of pre-processing steps, and then for each one, there are parameters, and of course, there's the order. And so- And the I, algorithmic choice. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are different algorithms, right, that you can choose filtering and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and. I mean, how do you, do you also have a language for formulating the constraints given by the domain scientists? Because they may say, okay, for temperature, for this kind of scale of effect that we're looking at, we already know it should be filtering only in such and such range, or, mm -hmm. but you don't know exactly what it is. So you need to kind of, I guess yes. you use the domain knowledge to constrain your search space. What is the language yeah. for that? So, so right now what we did, we map everything to Python. Uh -huh. So this framework, uh, I, I've skipped a few slides because I knew I'm, I was going to run out of time, but I have a slide 
that essentially shows the concept. So what the framework does, it allows you to, dis to describe like containers and how these containers fit together and what, you know, we have alternative explanation, like alternative choices with containers. And in these containers, you can put your, your own Python functions or functions from libraries in Python. Okay, and then this framework, when it goes and tries out the different things, it essentially calls your functions or the functions you're specifying in those containers. So we wanted to make it really elegant. So we don't want a new language. Uh, and I, I like Python, and apparently everyone in the scientific community likes Python. So we're going full steam in Python. Um, and, and some of the things we can hide nicely uh, as objects, you don't even real, realize they're objects. You just say, I want to create a new pipeline. These pipe, no, the pipeline has one stage, then it has one stage where you have, say, two alternatives, and then the third stage. And, and, and uh, our framework structure allows you to say, well, I have a pipeline, and the second stage is an alternative, and the alternative can call either uh, F1 or F2. And F1 and F2 can be functions in your Python. You know, I hope that is roughly uh, describes the idea. But uh, yeah, I, I had I actually have full examples with code if you, if you want. Mm -hmm. So you're basically your functions are library. We have a library of different functions that you can apply. Which yes, yeah, so so you need to have you know this, everything you have needs to be implemented somehow. So it's a finite space for now, you know. But uh, you have the alternatives where typically you have them anyway on your computer. And if you're looking at what people do manually, it's, oh yeah, let me try this out. And then let me configure this and look at the picture that's being generated. Oh, let me go back and tweak this a little bit. Uh, oh, let me replace this by something else. And this is the process we're trying to help you automate and scale. The thing that you would do anyway, but now you're doing it more efficiently, uh, maybe with more choices on more data. Mm -hmm. And of course, if lots of people use it, it also has a, the advantage that you can create, basically you can reproduce things more easily because you say I use this and this and this function with such and such parameters. Just yes. use the same on the data and you get exactly the same data product, which then you right. use in your analysis. Right. And if you, if you think this uh, you know, ahead in time, uh, we want to have cloud-based systems. So then you can share the workflows in the future with somebody else because the data is there and what we do is we also upload essentially the code and the workflow to be in the cloud. So if someone else logs into that environment, they can say, oh, I want to run your workflow. Um, I want to get, you know, see if, you, if I get the same results as the ones that are published, and I want to tweak your parameters and see maybe if I get something different, and then you might get a new idea and say, well, I want to introduce a third alternative here instead of this filter, I think I should be my special filter, okay? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've taken this with, you know, pretty straightforward uh, techniques for now, but uh, we can take this to the next level and make this much more complex. Um, you know, my, my first um, uh, motivation here was to build something, but also demonstrate it as quickly as we can that we can achieve something useful in geoscience. Because I don't want to build nice frameworks and, and search algorithms and techniques, and then they don't have any impact. Okay, so we, we've done things end to end, and now we can expand on all of these and make them you know, better, more complex, make the search more efficient, all these things, you know, improve the domain language, you know, how do we express this? Maybe there's other things that you wanna express, you know, what kind of constraints? You can imagine that you can express um, you know, formulas and this is, this is like my, my, my next step. You can express a model uh, you know, symbolically with formulas and then derive from that model things that uh, you, you have like invariants or, uh, or test cases that you want to test as you know, a, a test case in the sense I have a theory and I'm deriving phenomena that I expect to see in practice. Okay? And then you can test them and see if you find support for a falsification of your model. So this can go in various ways, uh, but this is, you know, this is just the first step. And um, that's why I, I like hearing, you know, the feedback from, from geoscientists and computer scientists, because that defines which is the most promising path to continue. So, 
I got a quick question for you, and I, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask questions more centered on the science, but actually it will be the political question that I'm going to pose that uh, I think is more uh, would be more important to the scientific community in large, and that is centered around uh, the the publication and issuing DOIs to. Uh, the functions or to with uh, your packages at uh, so that uh, a the science is uh, 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 by definition repeatable if you can open up a DOI it goes to the source code and, and reruns itself but that would also be useful for others to uh, get their DOI and, and name recognition have you looked into uh, what what you would need to do to go the next step of getting out of just GitHub and being able to issue DOI to uh, towards your own code base as well as others? Um, there we have looked into DOIs for data sets. So um, we have somebody here at Haystack who said, you know, if you have data sets, you can click on a button and, and, and uh, generate DOIs. Uh, I think there's, there's one issue that um, probably needs more discussion. Um, I, I think we, we can generate identifiers for anything. So even for code, we can think about hash values or something to really uh, try to characterize that you know everybody's using the same thing or referencing the same thing. However, um, I think this problem with repeatability is actually more complex than we think because there are many algorithms that are non-deterministic. Okay, or if you have parallel computing, uh, you sometimes have non-deterministic algorithms just because you have different uh, processing patterns. So rerunning the same thing on the same data set might lead to slightly different results. Um, so, and, and that's, that's an issue. Um, and if you have, uh, for example, randomized algorithms or uh, heuristics that use randomized components, to make their search more efficient. If you run the same thing again in your data set, you're gonna get a different result by design, okay? So um, I think we need to open up a new dimension, like what does it mean to be repeatable? Um, you know, we cannot expect to get the exact same result. Um, even running the, you know, more or less deterministic algorithms, again, if you have like floating point effects, um, you know, a numerical effects, you might not get the exact same result. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know about that, but maybe, um, I don't know if, is that the question that you had or? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, no, quite, the question was, that, no, no, I, I, I see it as the next stage is actually being able to publish. Uh, no, but part of that is, part of that is, uh, Indeed, these algorithms can have different uh, can have different outcomes, but uh, the outcome should, in in many of the sciences, should be at least uh, have some source of. There is obviously a, a place to publish seeing a burning bush and God talking to you, um, and, uh, but those are tend to be one one person noticing them. Uh, and the publications are uh, that many others that that we are worried about with DOIs are centered uh, center around at least some aspect of repeatability. Yeah, so, and, and I agree. We we can, uh, can. Can I say something very quickly? So um, there is there, there is an approach for linking uh, GitHub to. Uh, DOI systems like Zenodo, for example, so um, you can release your code base under a DOI every time every time you do a, a new release, um, and and that's a, a, an approach that you can I mean you can do it right now with uh, if you have a GitHub account. And the the other thing I wanted to say is that we are uh, 25 minutes over past uh, the the time that we were supposed to finish, so. Um, uh, um, uh, I think that that we should wrap it up here, and and we can continue the discussion offline because uh, it's it's getting out of hand. <laughs> uh, will you be at AGU? Yes, I'll be there. 
everyone else. I guess no. so I, I guess it's just us left. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, well, like, uh, we'll get a beer at AGU. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Great. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate that. And thanks for the questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, we will talk to you on AGU then. Yeah. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.